Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thanks for stopping in once again, Fading Memories listeners. I have an awesome duo of guests today. Returning again for, I think, the third time is Jincy Hines, and she brought along Steve, her wonderful hubby, and we're going to talk today a little bit about, um, Steve was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. I forgot to ask him how long ago, so they'll have to tell me, Um, and we're going to talk about why that's not the most horrible thing in the world, like we might all assume. So thank you for joining me, guys. Oh, thanks for having us. Good to see you again. Yeah, definitely. I'm sorry we missed each other when I was in Southern California, but one of these days we will see each other beyond Zoom. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So uh, I know that your you, Steve, were diagnosed with MCI when your son was in junior high, and I think he's been out of law school for two years. Is that correct? He graduated in 21. It'll be two years in May. Poof. Okay. So we're not too far off. I thought, see, my brain works pretty good sometimes. So what year... Was he diagnosed? He was diagnosed in December of 09. 09. Okay. That was the year my daughter graduated from high school. So I will be able to remember that. So for most people, most people are probably not super familiar with mild cognitive impairment. And I was not aware that until recently that everybody diagnosed with MCI does not necessarily develop a full form, di- full form, full, oh my goodness, <laughs> my brain is trying to flit, glitch on me, a full blown case of some sort of dementia or Alzheimer's. So that's good news. So maybe for the people who haven't heard your previous episode, maybe go back and what were the warning signs that something was going on? Well, <laughs> there were none for me. Absolutely none. It- <laughs> And um, you want to say anything? Or? So, okay, so no, he was just, he started to like, not, he said, oh, I couldn't, he couldn't remember the names of like the, these, this new group of young men who had joined our son's Boy Scout troop. And honestly, if you had told me they were identical, like triplets or quadruplets, I would have believed you. They all looked so similar. It was just this one group of kids that all looked very similar. I was like, oh, don't worry about it. And, you know, it didn't seem to be anything much. And, then he called me from work one day and said, oh, um, can you set up an appointment for me to go to the doctor? And being the kind, compassionate wife that I am, I said, is this about that memory thing? And he's like, yeah. And I thought, oh, no, no, Because I hear, I thought, well, you know, this was like October. He'd go and he'd talk to the doctor about it at his next visit. You know, like, you know how you go for, say, a physical around your birthday. So that's June. And, okay, that's fine. And. So he came home and he said, oh, I'm having, it was like a Wednesday. And he came home and said, oh, I'm having an MRI on um, Friday. Well, we were with an HMO. So two things. I thought, dear God, he's dying. And I thought, oh, come on. We all know uh, HMOs do not move that quickly normally. No. And, uh, and the center that he said he's going to doesn't have an MRI machine. So they must have one of those coming in for the day types. So I called and said, hey, you know, my husband's got an appointment on Friday for an MRI. Can we change that appointment? It's not really at a convenient time. Obviously, I was new to caregiving at this point. And um, they said, well, um, no, he's not getting an MRI. He's seeing a neurologist and he might be getting an MRI. I'm like, no, he told me he was getting an MRI. And they're like, yeah, he's not. And I was like, oh. So I called one of my friends and said, hey, can you do me a favor and pick up my son on the way to taking your daughter to junior high and went with him to the visit? And uh so the doctor said, okay, so we were going to put you through all these tests and it might take a while to get some of them. Now, this medical center was probably a good 30-ish minutes drive from our house. And by the time we got home, there were already two messages on the answering machine setting up tests for him. So we were fortunate because things moved very fast. And so when we went back in at the beginning of, the de- of December, um, the doctor said, oh, you have mild cognitive impairment. It may or may not develop into Alzheimer's. Um, pick up these prescriptions at your local pharmacy. Um, happy holidays, and we'll see you in February. And I thought, I wonder what that man just said. <laughs> you know, I was intelligent when I walked in here, and I am not any longer. You know, but that was the entire explanation of what he had, and it was like it was also confusing because it was like 
well, I know what mild means. We all have a, like a mild cold. And we know what cognitive means. That has to do with the brain. And we know what impairment means. It means something's not working quite right. And we've all heard the A word, Alzheimer's. That's just nasty stuff. We don't want any part of that. And he was 55. And, you know, so came home and, you know, used Google and connected with uh, Alzheimer's Orange County down here. And I was kind of like going, yeah, I, I think this was a mistake because... He's only, you know this one, he's only 55. I'm only 49 and we have a son in junior high. That didn't change anything. But I read early on that, yeah, that MCI, you either, a certain percentage of the people will develop Alzheimer's or another form of dementia. A certain percentage of the people will um, remain stable and a certain percentage of the people will improve. And I thought, okay, I'm not greedy. I'm going for stable. (laughs) It would probably be a lot to ask for improve, but I'm just going for stable. We could try for this one. That was kind of what was in my mind because I thought that seemed like a doable sort of thing. You know, that stable sounded that, you know, I thought that maybe going for improved was a little too aggressive. So yeah, I wasn't going to ask for too much right off the bat. So but I was fortunate because Steve was interested in, okay, the way he looked at it was, well, a part of my brain no longer works. So now it's time to develop the other side of my brain and get that work. So that was his approach and his outlook, you know, from the beginning was, okay, well, something doesn't work. So now, I mean, being an engineer, it's no surprise. Something doesn't work. What do you do? You find out what works instead, right? Yep. Fix it. Yeah. It can't be that hard. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think so. 2009 to what is this? 2023. That's math. I can't do math, but it's been a while. Number 13. 14 years. I'll be 14 in December. Whoo, okay. I was I was close. I'm like, it's between somewhere between 12, around 15. So I was explaining to my husband, I'm like, I know their son was in junior high. And I said, I'm pretty sure he graduated from law school. So that's like seven years of college plus four years of high school. <laughs> it's just like, I was puzzling it out. So I was yep. pretty close. Um, so did you immediately kind of go to let's find the fix or was there a period of what the hell, why is this happening to me? Uh, I never went into why is this happening to me because it never did happen to me. I just ignored that part of it. It was a club I didn't want to join and be part of. So I decided not to. I decided to, I could do certain things to make it look like I was just fine and my wife helped me create the illusion and I was able to pull that off and so then I started figuring out I've got to do something to make this continue well obviously you must have chosen the right path because we just said it's been 14 years so that's that's a good amount of stable I was also in a group of uh, maybe 21 people at it? Yeah, we, it? we did um, like a support group where uh, we'd start together and then he would be with the people who had some kind of impairment and I would be with the caregivers. And of course, he was by far, at 55 when he was diagnosed, he was by far the youngest in this group. And a lot of them, um, primarily male actually, and they, a lot of them had the attitude that I'm retired, I don't have to do anything. And I could watch them just go downhill. And I don't think any of them are still standing right now. So, But as I was watching that, them going downhill in front of my eyes, I thought, I definitely need another approach to what I'm doing. Something, something different. And so I started figuring out, um, I'm very logical. So the logical side of my brain is is very acute, and it was going down. So I thought, okay, my imagine my imaginary side of the the uh, you know, the art side, I can start funneling everything over there. And so I started taking art classes and anything that anything I'd never done before is what I did because I figured I'd never used that part of my brain. I figured there's more than enough. And they say you only use 10% of your brain. So I wanted that other 90% to be be useful for me now. Makes sense. And so I started uh, 
doing everything. I went back to school and um, uh, took art classes. I took uh, drawing classes. Um, I took uh, welding classes. I took um, anything that you had to use your hands for. I took it. And then all of a sudden, took this woodworking class that I got. That would have never happened. And it just turned out I love it. It was actually, you know, I just, you know, it, it, it really motivated me to do things, think about new, new concept of drawing, and it included everything that I could draw for a new design. I could make that new design. I could, uh, you know, do everything. It was fun. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Well, there's two, the, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to both of you is because, you know, as you know, Jinsey's posted um, a lot of your creations on her Instagram and I'm just blown away. My mom did woodworking before her Alzheimer's per- made it unsafe and she did some nice stuff, but she has not done anything on the scale that you've done. So that that's where it got my attention. But we hear about, you know, they might come up with a blood test to test for your risk factors for Alzheimer's or, you know, and a lot of people are like, I don't want to know, blah, blah, blah. There's nothing they can do. I I don't want to know, which is not the best. I mean, I understand why people feel that way. I mean, I went through this with my mom and a little bit with my maternal grandmother. My maternal great grandmother also had dementia, but she died before I was born. So I didn't have to deal with hers. But, you know, there's part of me that's like, "Eh, I don't know if I want to know, but there's so many reasons to know if, you know, you've got something going on, then you can make some adjustments like you have. But it's also, you know, we can make plans, we can get our affairs in order. And now you're doing things that you absolutely love. And I think that's so beneficial to our ba- our brains that, like, you're, you're helping yourself despite this diagnosis. And what you're doing is actually, it's like a twofold, I think. I'm not sure I'm verbalizing that very well. <laughs> and most people, most people don't get to do what they love to do. I've been able to do it my whole life. So now it's one of those things where that's what I like. You know, I like doing things I love to do. And that would be my greatest loss would be to do something that I didn't care about. That makes but sense. So I we need- should... We Why should tell, talk? sorry, we're having a Zoom lag. Can you but, tell the, the listeners, you were a special kinds of engineer. I was an imagineer. Yeah. I, I would say I used my imagination, but I, I really didn't. I, I worked as an engineer to make sure uh, everything at the Walt Disney Company's Disneyland would function as it was supposed to, get to rehab it, we would, uh, when something went wrong, or I had to, to be there and go, okay, this is going to be fun, here's what we're going to do. <laughs> and so it, uh, Dis- Disneyland was my playground, so I had the machine shop there, I had the weld shop, I had the paint shop, I had all these fun shops that just, you know, it was just so much fun. But you didn't do creative stuff before. No, no, didn't didn't, didn't come up with new attractions. Didn't I just uh, maintained the attractions that we had? But uh, others that were very creative created these attractions. I they could tell me this is what we want. I could go, yeah, I can, make that. I can make that. That's not a problem. So it, uh, but for me to come up and go. Then it's going to do this, and you're going to swing around, and then it, you know, yeah, that's not. Just tell me what you need, and I can do that. See, that's really cool. So you started taking all these classes, and where were these classes? Where did you take them? Just at the junior local junior colleges, and, which makes uh, it more affordable and probably a little more accessible. Yes, yes, because you know they're right down the street, so you didn't have to go that far, and. You didn't have to qualify to get in. <laughs> That's to show up. You just had to show up and pay your money. And, you know, I think the first time I did it, I think a lot of the people looked at me and say, you know, I don't think so. But 
I had to, you know, I could stay anyway. But that it was right. But we're fortunate because there's like four different community colleges in this area that Steve's attended over this time. And but there's at least a couple of more that are within driving distance as well, a reasonable distance. So we are very fortunate. And then of course the cost to go to community college is affordable. You know, so that's been nice. And you know, so I still take two classes and maybe drop one, and then we have the credit, you know, that carries over to the next semester. And Different cl- colleges have offered different specialties. So like when um, he wanted to take a machine shop class, that was at one of, at one college. And then when he did welding, that was at a different one. And now, as he said, he makes furniture, and that's at a third one. And um, what's great, too, is we don't have the room, because we didn't take at least giving up the garage, or the finances it would take to have a wood shop in our garage, a full-on wood shop. But going to the community college, they, has, they have $5 million worth of equipment that they get new machines constantly. So, and then they have somebody who runs behind it and they sharpen the tools and make sure they're right and uh, adjust the machines. And, you know, all that stuff I thought was magic behind the scenery, which I didn't know about. But I took a maintenance class and it was just, I, you know, got down on my knees and thanked the guy who was doing it because. He just did an incredible job, and I didn't even know he was doing it. Yeah, that would make some of the hobbies more fun if you had a cleanup crew and a maintenance crew following you along. Well, you know, see that. Remember how, like, when your daughter was little and you set up a craft for her, and it takes you an hour and a half to set it up, and in five minutes she's done because it's easy or she's bored with it, as compared to when you paid the five bucks or the ten dollars and you took her to the little community event. And they supplied everything. They set it all up. And then she still was done in five minutes, but you at least got to have fun. You didn't have to set it up, plan it, or clean it up. In a way, it's like that. You know, I mean, he plans his projects, but all the equipment's there. He doesn't have to own it, maintain it, clean it. It's great. You know, and when he did some, I'd call it ceramics. Um, You know, he didn't have to have a kiln. He didn't have to have the pottery wheel. He didn't have to have all these Didn't have to have the paints. Didn't have that, you know. No. I just went there and. Did my thing. And so it's really convenient. As I say, everywhere those teachers are cleaning up after you that you don't even realize that they're doing it. It's been not, you know, when he wants to do something, he just kind of looks through a college schedule and it's like, oh, what's available now? You know, <laughs> or when he hasn't liked something, he's like, okay, well, like he started with um, machine shop classes at first and did those for one or two semesters and then set, came home and said, I'm not safe doing that anymore. It's not safe for me to do these for me or for other people. So I need to find something else. And he did like an auto maintenance class one time. He's done painting, photography. You did like something with the theater. I, I was a theater manager. or um, A set manager? Or a the backstage manager. Backstage manager. <clears throat> where I was controlling the props and the people going in and out. That would be fun. Yes. He did, <laughs> did welding did for welding. a while. Uh, movie movie class, oh, yeah. how how to film movies, and I filmed, filmed a couple movies, and so yeah. I really love that. I didn't love and, being the in the movies though. <laughs> yeah. the model when he's but, done photography, I'm not good at those things apparently. But the school supplies all of that equipment, the, the movie, all the movies, the lights, and everything. Yeah, and the cameras for the you know they supply everything, so you don't have to have anything. You know, doesn't get any. That- yeah, no, that is awesome. My mom did woodworking through, I think, the adult education in our county. It's been a little while. Um, what did she make? Well, <clears throat> no, my grandfather made it. We have a like a a miniature wooden sleigh, like Santa's sleigh. And my oh, grandfather yeah. m- made. My mom painted. We used it in our photography studio until they retired. And then they had it at their house. And after... Um, my dad died and we moved mom to memory care. I just said, this is the only thing I want. And it, we didn't really have a place for it in our old home, but we had the perfect place for it in the new one. And it was kind of nice to set it all up and, and have a memory of my maternal grandfather and my mom. And, you know, so what did she make? She made smaller things, but she was working her way up. So let me, and this is where somebody might want to jump on the, YouTube. So this mm-hmm. is, I think this cabinet is something that's almost somewhat recent. Yes, that was about, that was two years ago. 
and I call that my portable man cave. And you can keep all your stuff you want and it moves around. You can put it in any room. Um, we basically found out we can put the computer on it and watch TV off So the then we'll computer. hook up the computer to the TV, yeah. you know, if you're an older TV, and then we can watch, you know, our Amazon Prime movie on the TV, which is fun. But but it, but it's all uh, the, I guess it'd be the uh, right hand door slides around. Like a roll top like desk roll -top opens? Like a desk opens. Except just to the side. Yeah. And then they have two drawers in there and they have stops so they don't fall out. And then the other cabinet, you can keep anything else you want in there. There's a shelf in there. And yeah, there's a shelf at the bottom there. And then there's a secret, there's a secret panel in there that you can hide all, all your valuables in there. <laughs> That's kind of a fun thing because all, all the, this is a 18 or 1908, um, design. And back then everybody had little places that would lock behind the cabinets to keep their, their valuables. And so I can continue that tradition by having that little lock up place. Which makes sense. Where do you get the patterns? Like, are you, cause I know this is a craftsman style, correct? This is a craftsman. Um, it's my designs are from the green and green brothers. Uh, and uh, the Hall the Hall brothers manufactured this type of uh, furniture, but I designed these myself. I take everything I like of one piece and I put all of them together and design one where I get to do all of the things I like on a piece of piece of furniture, not just having one piece. So this 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 is one of those that their the design has four or five. Um, of their best designs in it. Well, that's where your engineering brain comes into play because you got to piece piece all those designs together to get what you want. Which that's not an easy feat, no matter what. Like I could, I don't think I could do that. I'm yeah. I'm half entrepreneur, half artist, so sometimes I underestimate my option, my skills. But yeah, it, it's it, it, it's one of those things where yeah, I I'll go through and I'll see something. And I'll see another one, and I'll put another one, and I make a monster out of it and put it all together. Then I have to figure out how to connect it so it looks halfway decent. So it doesn't look like a little monster. <laughs> Franken cabinet. Yes. So then I, I love this one. This, this is an outdoor light in a craftsman style, correct? Yes. And that is one of my favorite ones because... Um, I had to learn how to do stained glass to make the stained glass on it. So uh, it took a, a month to learn how to do stained glass and get, get everything together, how to break the glass and get everything lined up and put it back together. And then actually how, you know, I have to take a look at pictures and go, now how did they do this? What was the pattern for putting this together? Because you use glue, but you also have to have for outside, you have to put screws in it to keep it together because of the weather. So you have to figure in the little black pieces are um, ebony. And the green, green used ebony on, as, to, as to cover their, their screw holes. And so then I had to learn how to deal with ebony and how to carve it and how to you know, make it all. But yeah, that, that is one of my favorite things. I just, that's what, that's what really got me started in green and green. It's, uh, Wall spouses. And so did, just, the, did the stained glass courses also come through the community college? They have them, but I did it on my own. I figured uh, I'd just take the book YouTubes and, you know, I didn't have time to take a class. And plus, it's very expensive. It, stained glass is unbelievably expensive. So... I was just talking to some gals. One of the reasons I like making handmade greeting cards is if you come up with something you don't like, it's just a piece, like a par fraction of a piece of paper, maybe a little bit of ink. You're not even talking a couple bucks. If you hate it, you know, you can chop it up and use it in some other project or you could just throw it away. But with stained glass, well, the other thing with making cards is the learning curve is not huge. So that's nice. You can start you can start making pretty cards pretty much from the get-go. But with 
like your projects, you know, those take those take some uh, learning curves to climb up. <laughs> they have learning curves, and the learning curves can eat your fingers. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Very careful that uh, you don't do something stupid because, like a cable saw is a very dangerous piece of equipment and you know you you bring one home and you start using it without knowing you're going to lose a finger on it that's just because there's so much to it and you don't know why you lose fingers then <laughs> by a class they say this is why and that's what the classes do how to do things safely because you know I'd never heard of a writing knife and that's a little knife that comes up in the middle of a uh, uh, table saw, and that's what stops it from coming back and going through you. <laughs> like, that sounds important. You know, it's called kickback, and I've never knew what caused it or they had not, not much thought about it, but they say if you do anything wrong, it'll kick you back, and as it's kicking the wood back, it pulls your hand into the saw because that's the definition of kickback, because you can't move your hand fast enough. And so this is it, it was all safety that I was really important to me. And me. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't want to add losing a limb to MCI, so <laughs> that's right. probably smart that you took it through the, the colleges. And you get to socialize too, which is yeah. you know another important aspect of maintaining brain health that we were talking about. I don't know if we were hitting re if we'd hit record or not, but um, we said, I said, hopefully one of these days I get to meet you guys in person and not just through zoom, but we'll, we'll get there. We're just on opposite ends of the state. <laughs> it's a big state. So what do you prefer more? The, um, woodworking or the painting? Let me pull up one of your paintings here. That's a sales. The, yeah. I have too many windows, sales, sailboats. There we go. I can speak today. <laughs> now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now, fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Yeah, I, I, I did that one and I also made the frame. I but, believe I rescued that one yeah, out of the trash. She re rescued, the, rescued that picture out, that of the picture trash. out of the trash. There's a couple of them like that that I've rescued from the trash, and that was one of them. Yeah, I'll, I'll look at it and I'll say, okay, this, this was just my first run at it, or it, it's got to go. But the name of that is Going Out to Sea, spelled S-E-E. -E. And it's going out, and it's like what I'm doing. I'm going out to see if I can do this. And and I work work to really, and I think this worked a lot on getting my brain moved over to the other side, and the artwork and everything, because I really didn't do, oh, I didn't do artwork before. The closest I came to painting was I painted the house. <laughs> yeah, that's not very artistic. That's a chore. <laughs> so the, these were um, basically new things that. I was doing. And, uh, and I know that when you learn new things, especially things that take an effort to learn, you right. actually build up neuroplasticity and new, new neurons. That's really hard to say. And so your, your plan of attack for 
dealing with MCI was smart. And that's, again, why I wanted to talk to you guys, because, you know, people need to know that there are things we can do. We can do things like I take, you know, I've learned new things. I put myself out there because I got this family history of dementia. No, thank you. I'm not going to be the fourth generation. And there's, there's things we can do. Even if like with you, you do get a diagnosis that isn't necessarily the uh, most exciting thing in the world to hear. And obviously what you're doing is working because it's been 14 years and you know, you're doing good. You're, you're making furniture I couldn't make. So, <laughs> And then uh, we were talking about the painting, but you didn't answer the question. Do you like woodworking or painting more? Or do you like to do both? I, li I like to do the woodworking the most. I, re I really enjoy that. You know, I kind of have some of the equipment in the garage. In fact, I had to get a saw stop because you can put your hand in a saw stop and it shuts down, gets out of the way, and it won't hurt you. So it has a safety equipment that stops you from getting hurt and so that was the only way i could bring a saw a table saw home is if it was that type they demonstrated using a hot dog Ooh. <laughs> touch it and the saw goes down instant and there's no cut or anything on the, nope. the hot dog that's amazing yes amazing technology they have and safe and safe yes yeah safe is good my maternal grandfather um his index finger must have been on his left hand he was using a, you know, handsaw and he pulled it back through the tip of his finger. So he never went to World War II. He was a chef for the um the officers. It didn't stop him from hunting, but yeah, his index finger was slightly deformed from basically just a handsaw, not even a power tool. So I can only I've used some power tools. And I have weird vision, so I don't have depth perception, so it's really hard. And I still would like to do some DIY projects, but I really didn't like using the tools because I never felt like I could do it safely. So it's nice to know that there's some new technology that maybe, yeah. I, maybe I should go back and look at the tools. Yeah. <laughs> the new technology they have now is phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. And getting taught how to do it makes up for anything that you know, safety wise that they don't have. You have to learn how to use them. It isn't a normal thing to just wake up and you automatically know. It's, you know, that's a five horsepower motor going around in circles and it doesn't, it'll, it'll cut a hand, it'll cut a piece of wood, it'll cut metal, it doesn't care. <laughs> I mean, and that's the thing. I mean, if you consider how, in a sense, easily it goes through something like a piece of wood, a hand is nothing. Yeah. I mean, it's not like it has a brain and it thinks about it. It's going to cut whatever you put in its path. Yeah. It does its job. It does it very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how I feel. So, Steve, what would you tell people who are, like, similar to me, maybe have a family history of Alzheimer's, maybe they've gotten an MCI diagnosis, what would you tell them they sh they sh like you skipped the woe is me stage, which was probably beneficial. I don't know if most of us are, are capable of that, but what, what would you suggest that people do to help keep their brains strong either as we're aging or like yourself got a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment and it seems to be still mild. So that's wonderful. What would you suggest they do? Get involved with making your mind better. It's, you know, everybody goes to the gym and works out, but you don't go to the gym and work out your brain. You need to work your brain out. And that is by doing things you've never done before and keeping it, keeping your, your brain engaged. If you don't do that, it will be just like your muscles. It will atrophy. And it's like, well, what did you think it's going to do? If you're not, if you're not going to work your muscle and you're just going to sit sit around and watch the grass grow, it's, you know, you don't need your brain anymore, so it will wander away. So it, it's really important that you are proactive. And this is a full-time job. This is not um, do it now, this week, and maybe next month I'll do something. This is a full-time job working your brain, you know, more than you've ever done before, you know, if you think it's eight hours, you're wrong. It's, it's, uh, 
it's even more than that, and you don't get weekends off. It's and, true. <laughs> yeah, you have to keep on it. And if you do that, I'm finding that, yeah, you go down a little. I, I, I still need help with words and how I misplace words. And hey, so does everybody else. And I'm okay with people helping me with words. And it does, you know, gets, gets, doesn't, I don't get frustrated with it. It's just, uh, you know, you've got to use your brain in other ways, not just how you've been using it your whole life. You've got to use that 90% that you haven't been using. Yeah. Now, did you change anything else? Lifestyle changes? Did you guys change how you eat? Did you start exercising more? Or was that always a pretty uh, positive aspect of your life? I hate Jinsy's that. laughing. <laughs> oh. Um, exercising is really important. And she drags me out screaming and kicking every day. Most days. Most days, yeah. And it, that was like the only thing that every doctor was consistently saying when he was first diagnosed. The only thing that they were consistent on was go for a walk. Honestly, that was their the one thing. Go out for a walk. So we live near, near a nice park. We'll go for a walk. And be, sometimes it'll be like, well, you haven't gone for a couple of days. We need to get out for a walk. Um, you know, we tried to, I'll just say, clean up the diet. I, we're, I'm, we're really not good at the plant-based, although, but I will say for anyone who's considering whether or not they should do plant-based, get your cholesterol tested, do your plant-based diet, or, you know, have your results from last year when the doctor says, hey, it's time to get your cholesterol tested in a few weeks, go to a strictly plant-based diet for a couple of weeks. You'll be shocked at the positive results you get. It's almost not fair. I mean, it just, <laughs> it's true. And, you know. It's such a dramatic change that it, it just, it's not fair. But we I mean, haven't stuck yeah, with it. So yeah. I, we need to do that. But, you know, the socializing, of course, is a big thing. I mean, when Steve retired from Disney um, because of his health, he got to join the Golden Ears, which is their, you know, the Ears. So he got to, re to join their retirement club and he's gotten involved in that and served many years on the board and then still goes to the meetings once a month. And then one of the neighbors, after many, many years of trying, got him involved in Kiwanis. So like Rotary, so he goes to meetings twice a month and then he now has a group of guys he meets every week for breakfast one day a week. And so, you know, those things, you know, you don't have to sit there and say, oh, socialize. I've got to, oh, I've got to do X to socialize. It's just, we were all peril, you know, or, or hurt by what happened with COVID because this was the extent of socializing, which was, that is better than nothing. But so People became more reclusive and decided they really liked being at home, which is great, but that's not good for your brain. That's not good for your mental health. It's not good for that brain health, though. And, you know, getting out there and talking to people, that is important. Um, you know, so that, the diet, the, ex the exercising that he hates, <laughs> the, um, you know, and just the learning new things and the going to different places, too. Like, we'll go to... Oh, like this morning, we actually already went to a used book sale at one of the local libraries. And so, you you know, it's not, say, a big deal. It's not a big event, but you're looking through the books. You're making choices. You're socializing with people as you're there. So a lot of things involve a lot of different components, and they all add up to helping the brain. You know, you might go to a lecture at the senior center um, or attend, you know, some little function at... Oh, we went to a, a hockey, hockey game, game last week and um, we went to a concert with the piano guys last mm -hmm. week. We had a busy week last week. And, you know, or well, the, our city does concerts on the green in the summer, like a lot of the cities do. And so we, um, we walk over because they're close enough to walk. And we may not stay very long, but sometimes we'll like one concert, we'll usually take dinner, but then we walk over and then I have to stop and visit the people I know there. And he's stuck talking to them as well. You know, but it's not like I'm not always thinking, OK, here's my plot. We're going to get out. We're going to get out of the house. We're going to go for a walk. We're going to socialize. A lot of things just happen to involve all of that. Like, you know, even when you took your RV trip down to um, Southern California, yes, for a, for a portion of it while you're driving, it's you and your husband. But you get down here and it's not like you can be in a bubble and not talk to anyone else on the tour and you're seeing new things. And the great news is all of that is fantastic for the brain. The brain thrives on and craves novelty. 
you know, but that's so- good to know. Cause I drive my husband bananas. So we went to, well, we went to San Diego in 2015, which was wonderful. And he's like, Oh, we got to come back. And he's like, I know what you're going to say. And I'm like, no, you don't. There are things down here we didn't do. So we can come back. We just can't do the same things. And we also went to Jamaica in 2016 for my 50th birthday. And we, what we did, well, I did, he, he pooped out. He ended up on the SAG truck. I rode my bike across the island with a tour group, which there were times I was like, why the hell did I decide to do this for my 50th birthday? I had um, unfortunately broken my collarbone in May. And so I hadn't been riding my bike as much as I had, would have planned for for this trip. And they kept saying, oh, this is Jamaica. This is not a race. But they wanted us to ride at race speeds, which was not my thing. Still not my thing. And, you know, but I would go back because we didn't get to go to the plantations and the rum factories or whatever they're called. I don't think factories is the right word. But I, I really, really crave novelty. I mean, I like, I like kind of a steady base and then I want to shoot off and try all kinds of new things. Like I'm going to Washington DC in March, but with the Alzheimer's association, but I'm going technically by myself because I'll be flying out from Sacramento and I don't know the gal that's also going with our group uh, or with our, you know, our district office advocacy team. I don't, I know you're with the Alzheimer's orange County. I don't know if you've done any, legislative advocating, but that, yes. that was a new thing. Um, they've moved our state advocacy from February to May. That'll be cool. Cause I'm a lot closer to Sacramento than I used to be, although it's still an hour away. And you know, all those are all new things. And I just, I really crave, I like, like I said, you know, got to have a stability of, of the same, but I, I need a good home base to shoot off from. So have you been to DC before? Nope. Oh, well, let me know oh. if you need any recommendations. And you said you're going in March? Yep. I think cherry blossom time, too. I hope I so. Those ones are just starting. I, I, I call that Disneyland for grownups. It does. It is so wonderful. It's I, awesome, it, it just It's great. You, you've got to stay at least two months <laughs> to get everything done. And there's so much there that you can do that's yeah. free, too. Oh, that's good. Because it wasn't on the budget, but... They offered a little bit of a stipend to go, and I'm like, "Well, I've wanted to go for four years, and uh, you, you know, you'll... now's now's the time." So <laughs> I'm off. Just send me an email if you need any recommendations on anything. I'll give you a list that's going to be way too long. Okay, but- well, I'll add you to. We have um, very close friends who um, he traveled back to DC for work a lot. He was with Lawrence Livermore Lab, huh? and. He's like, narrow down what you're interested in and he'll kind of help direct me in the right directions. And we chatted yesterday and I said, well, let me figure out what I want to do that maybe hubby wouldn't necessarily want to do. Like he would definitely want to do the air and space museum. I'm not necessarily, I mean, it wouldn't be in the top five, but I would want to see it. So we'll do that another time when he can come. Oh, there you go. That's good. Yeah. Save some of those things, but. Well, like last year, we had the opportunity to go twice to Montgomery, Alabama, because our son um, joined the Air Force last year, and he was there for training. And people were like, hmm, Montgomery? I will tell you, it was an amazing place. But, you know, we went, you know, with an open attitude of, well, let's see what we see there. Let's explore it. And, and like you said, that we went back a second time in December, and we were able to... Um, well, we were able to learn the difference between a tornado watch and a warning. So that was good. Um, and we didn't have to deal with the scary part. And we went to the Capitol. We went to the first Confederate Capitol, which is a stone throw from the Capitol. Because yeah. Montgomery is the state capital, even though it's a super tiny town. You know, we ate Jamaican food. We, oh, we did axe throwing yeah. the first time we were there. Because yes. we <laughs> stumbled into an axe throwing place. The guy said, oh, you want to try it? Sure. We just did that last month for our, the same friend's birthday. Ah. There's a place here called Auburn Axe for anybody that's in the general area. And it's owned by a firefighter. So I'm like, hello, we must go and do this. So we did. It was so much fun. We're going to go back. See, hubby was reluctant. He's like, oh, I don't know about that. I'm like, what the hell? It's just like, you go, you throw axes. If you don't like it, you don't go again. And ah. now he wants to go regularly. So it's, you know. He was reluctant to do things. But I can yeah. say, oh, let's just give it a try. Yeah, that's true. 
Um, a lot of things you start closing up. You don't talk as much as you used to. And as people used to say, I used to talk a lot. I don't anymore. So I try to work on it, but you know, for some reason, I, and I have no idea why, but you just, it isn't your thing anymore. So I try to work, work on that and try to engage people and talk. And I said, you know, you just had to stick a mannequin and I would talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So is there any advice either one of you two want to leave the listeners about, you know, understanding the risks and what we can do to mitigate them. Cause I've, as I've said a lot on this show, I do not think modern life is good for our brains. Unfortunately. I mean, obviously I like modern life because I like my technology. There was a day we had about 13 hours of no internet. And I was like, I cannot work. I cannot do my workouts. Cause I have a Peloton. Um, I can't watch TV. Oh my God, what am I supposed to do myself? And I'm like, this is pathetic. I used to live in a time when we didn't have computers and the internet. I'm sure I could figure out something. <laughs> and it was crazy. But yeah, I don't think modern life, you know, it's, we have noise pollution, air pollution, terrible processed foods. People drink too much. They don't get enough sleep or stressed out. So... Mitigating all those factors is important, but do you have any last minute advice for anybody that might be in a similar position to you guys? If you need to sleep, sleep. You can get up and you can continue on from there, but doing this makes you tired. Working like this, it, um, uh, I have hearing aids and I have them turned down real low because when I hear too much noise, it takes too much of the processing out of my brain and that tires me out. So you, you've got to really pay attention to what your body's doing and how it's behaving. And when you start paying attention, you can start learning what to do about it to make it do what you need it to do. But you have to listen to it before you can, you know, it, it doesn't work when you force it. You have to listen to it then follow it. That makes sense. And I think we're kind of programmed as a society to, you know, go do hustle, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, go, go, go. We're not really conditioned to be like, man, my body's telling me, eh, slow down today. I, I've listened to that a lot more since, since 2022. It's like, I now know what it is. Like I'm, I'm very much an introvert. I have no problem working and making my pretty cards and talking to the dogs and, but, you know, after doing that for three years, I need to be around people more. But then I also know when I'm done with people. So, <laughs> yeah, that's, I think that's important. And, you know, you shouldn't be afraid to get help. You know, if you're having a hard time dealing with stuff, reach out. I mean, you can do counseling on Zoom or online now. But, you know, insurance probably covers it as well. And it doesn't hurt to have a psychologist to talk to, whether you're the caregiver or the person with the problem. Um, you know, but so many of these things, it's like the resources are there, reach out and use them. And the big thing is you're not alone. You're not the only one facing this, whether you're the person with the impairment or the caregiver. And it makes you feel so much better to, um, to find out there's other people. Cause I know you are involved with a support group. I feel, aren't you like a support group leader? And I attend a support group. And it's just such a help. I mean, I had my meeting last night and sometimes people will be like, no, I'm not going to go to a sick heart group because it's so depressing. It's like, I don't know about yours, but ours, we do a lot of laughing in it too. We help each other out. We laugh about things. You know, we get along great. You know, it's like, a, it's a group of friends that you get to see once a month. The group that I facilitate is a pretty, is a fairly big group, although we haven't quite recuperated from the holidays, I guess. And I wasn't, I didn't facilitate in January and they had a little bit of a, they thought I was going to send out the e reminder email. And I was like, that's not my job if I tell you I'm not going to be here. <laughs> so we're, we're trying to get back to the numbers we had before, but they are so supportive of each other. I mean, I think all they need me for is to like open the Zoom link. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I really don't know why I'm here. It's like, I have, I know so many people that, you know, there was one question this gal got an answer from her um let's see neuropsychologist 
And I said, that doesn't sound right. I know somebody who's a neuropsychologist. Do you mind if I ask him this question for you? And she goes, oh, no, that'd be great. And so I asked him and then reported back to her in an email. And basically, I don't remember what the question was, but it was like, I know people. If I don't have an answer, I know lots of people who have answers. So, But they they support each other and... You know, some somebody will say, I'm having this issue, and somebody else will chime in, and I'm just like, I'm over here just uh, moderating the Zoom call. <laughs> I, would but it's say, fun. I was going to say one more thing, too, is that we um, relied on this phrase about it's not the end of the road, it's a bend in the road. And I think that's what's so important is you have to realize, so you've got this diagnosis, and um, what can you, how can you, how can you handle it? How can you continue to live your life to the best and the fullest that you can? You know, I mean, it's not going to be Oprah Winfrey live your best life scenario, but it's going to be pretty darn close if you make it that way. Yeah, I, I have to say I never would have done any of this if I never got that di- diagnosis. I would have uh, repeated the last 10 years, the last 13 years the way. So just to be able to repeat the last years before and, and nothing would have changed nothing i wouldn't have learned anything i've just been the same you know i've just been going along but this it really changed my life and not in a bad way i mean it, i've been able to you know enjoy my son growing up and being around and doing furniture and yeah that wouldn't have happened yeah. well that's an I- excellent go ahead jincy i was just gonna yeah. say well that always reminds me too is that that you know, so now Steve is technically of retirement age since he's over 65. And that's one thing I've noticed is people um, don't plan for this because I'm funny because it's not exactly on topic, but it does relate to the cognitive abilities. When you don't plan for retirement. You say, oh, I'm just going to do nothing. OK, that's wrong. I don't want to tell you the truth, but that's not your best choice. Think about when you're in the, you're still in those working years and you get those ideas that, wow, I'd love to get involved in community theater, just write them down, just make an idea. Because let's face it, later, we always go, I wonder what that was I wanted to do. <laughs> so just have this list, this crazy list of all the things you want to do. I want to uh, ride my bike across Jamaica. I want to uh, go backstage at the San Diego Zoo and see the animals. I want to do all these crazy things. And then when you are retiring, you go, oh, I, I'm going to just do nothing. You can go, oh, wait, I have this list of things I want to do. I think I'll start working away at it because doing that doing new things you're learning new things and you're not just doing the thing that everybody says as well i'm just going to start out by doing chores i don't know about you but chores are not the most important part of my day so keep learning keep being active in life keep being mentally active physically active and getting out and doing things i agree with that we've discussed so my husband's 58 i'm 56 and we do enjoy going out in our trailer my maternal grandparents, when my grandfather retired, they sold their home in 1985 and went on the road in their 35-foot fifth-wheel trailer. And oh. they had some of the best adventures. Now, my grandmother ended up with vascular dementia. My grandfather passed away from cancer. So I am so glad they did those things. Oh. There was even a time when, and I don't know why they did this. I'm going to have to ask somebody if they know what the reasoning was. They loaded all of the rigs, so this 35-foot fifth wheel and the big dual dual axle truck. So I don't even know how long that is, probably close to 50 feet. There was, they were in a whole group. They loaded them on flatbed train cars and, and oh. trained them, trucked them into Mexico. And I don't know oh. why the heck they didn't drive, but, <laughs> you know, how often are you going to have that experience? You know, so I like your suggestion of write down all the, just write down all the crazy things you might even want to consider doing. And then you'll have a list of things you might want to try. And then, you know, like we've discussed maybe selling the house and going on the road because I have not seen enough of the 48 states. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if that's a West Coast thing. My dad didn't really like to travel a lot. So I got a lot of catching up to do. And that might be the only way to get to see them. (laughs) Yeah, well, if we if we hit the road for a year or two. Well, in California, we're yeah. so big that it's like it takes effort to get to another state. So when we visited our son in December and it was like we drove from, you know, we left Alabama on a Friday and arrived in New Jersey on a Sunday and we went through 10 states. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you know, I mean, in 24 days, yeah. I think we hit 11 states and 
and DC as we drove past it. So, I mean, it's like, you know, it's on the East Coast, I'd say it's a lot easier to hit those states. So, yeah, get out there and do something. Go for it. And well, we, had, we go had ahead. by uh, Washington, D.C., because we love it so much. So we just circled around and continued on. And that was just exciting to me. <laughs> yeah, I'm really looking forward to D.C. And one of the things. So, again, last year, 2022, we were coming home from Arizona. Now, there's two ways to come home from Arizona. The main way is to go west to basically Los Angeles and then north up I-5. And if anybody has not driven I-5, you can literally do it with your eyes closed. It is flat. It is straight. It is boring. Oh, it's gosh, oh, yes, we man, did it last year. Did, yeah, it's and, boring. Yeah, it's, it's kind of depressing, too, with yes. all those dead trees. Yeah, and it's just, it's it's so boring that you, uh, like, I went from Contra Costa County to Pasadena in 2018 and I literally queued up podcasts because you just kind of get lulled into this, like, yeah. s- you know, sedated state and you're driving, you know, I don't know how much my car weighs, but, you know, it's like, you got to be careful. And so when my husband's like, well, we could do this and go up I-5, I'm like, because he left before me, I flew to Arizona. And I said, um, if we're going to drive up I-5 with the trail, I'll just stay home. I, you know, I don't need to do I-5 ever again. I totally understand that. We get that, having done it last year. So we drove up the east, eastern part of California. Now, I am a multi-generational Californian. He moved here when he was 13. There were parts of California I didn't even know existed. And they're beautiful. And I'm like, where's this gigantic 15,000 foot high mountain been my whole life? <laughs> I felt like a real dork. But it was just so gorgeous. And now it's like, okay, there's some parts of California we need to go back to. You know, we've had so much rain. We're hoping for a super bloom oh, and we might be able to f- load up the trailer and, I don't know, park on the side of the road because I know with the super blooms, you kind of run out of space. Well, have you ever watched um, the PBS show? Well, down here it's on PBS. Um, California's Gold. Mm-mm. Oh, my gosh. Okay, if you go to chapman.edu, Chapman University has all the... Um, it's this man who has sadly passed away, Huel Hauser. He was from Tennessee. So he comes across as a real nice good old boy, which he was, it seemed. And he goes all over the whole state. And he, like you say, you'll find out these places and you'll go, oh, I want to go there. Oh, I've been there. I, Oh, my gosh. Whoever heard of this? California's gold. Look it up. Definitely. We I, had friends whose daughter went to Chapman. So multiple connections our, there. Oh, actually, I went there, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I went there. I went to San Francisco State. So my, my whole education was way different than that. But this has been great. See, we're talking about all these things we all want to do. So I hope we're giving people ideas on how to live your best life. Maybe even if you have a unfortunate diagnosis or maybe just to avoid having the typical yeah. slowdown we do get as we age. Cause you know, our brains are like older computers at some point. They just, they just don't work as fast as the latest model. So that's, that's my analogy for brain health. You there know, you, you, you could, like Steve said, you know, you can't have like a lot of external, you know, noise and input because it just, it's too much for the brain to process. And I, I agree. I don't have MCI, but I like a little bit of talking. I'll listen to podcasts or I'll listen to music because I don't like it super quiet, but I don't want it super noisy either because it's just, my brain just wants to shut down. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> so I appreciate this. In the show notes are going to be Jincy's other shows that we we linked, that, or I will link her other shows. Can you tell I didn't get to do my workout today? <laughs> I think Peloton was having an issue because the the streaming was not working quite right. So I'm like, I give up. I'll do something later. But I really need that exercise to get the blood flowing to my brain so that it works. It's working okay, but it could be better right now. <laughs> I really appreciate this. And... Thanks for joining us, Steve. It's like I've known about you, but I've never actually seen you. So this has been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been our pleasure, too. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.